welcome back everybody to another episode of Ask and Answer with Fundraising Academy at National University. We're super excited because we have superstar Meredith Terrian. Hey, welcome back, Meredith. Ah, thank you. It's been a little while, but I'm so happy to be back here and um, being in the hot seat this time instead of being a host. So this is great. <laughs> you know, I was telling somebody yesterday within your team, I'm like, wow, Meredith Terrian is like so brilliant. She's like, she's got like this brain that I just always want to like get into and hear what she has to say, because um, I love the the take that you have on a lot of our questions that come in. And so uh, this is always a joy to be able to work with you. Um, I'm really, really excited, as I said, to have Meredith Terry and just to in a, reintroduce her. Meredith is one of the, the trainers at Fundraising Academy, but she's also the founder of the Allied Group. Talk to us about what your, I'm going to use the word specialty is and what you do in the sector. So, um, so this is great. So yes, I founded the Allied Group a few years ago, back actually in 2018. And I started off doing a lot of strategic planning with nonprofits, um, which is truthfully one of my favorite things to do. Uh, mm -hmm. But that kind of turned into a lot of capital campaigns. So there's a lot of strategy mm -hmm. that goes into capital campaigns, yeah. planning them, executing them, facilitating them. So I do a lot of work with capital campaigns as well, including things like feasibility studies. And so um, so it's been it's been such a roller coaster. I started the, the company in 2018 and here we are several years later. And um, I can tell you, I've had the opportunity to work with you know, organizations across the country, which is one of the more unique things about being a consultant. I mean, you get this really incredible opportunity to work with organizations of all different size, missions, um, budgets. And so it's been it's been exciting. And you, Meredith, also, I, I feel like you really have your finger on the pulse of veterans um, organizations, um, our service personnel. Um, and, and can you talk a little bit about that as well? Because that's a really unique perspective that you bring to the table. And I know we've had you on as a co-host to facilitate conversations when we have had vet organizations on. Yeah, so absolutely. So on a, on a personal note, let me share with you this. So I've been a Marine Corps spouse for the past almost 15 years. And so I've had a really unique and intimate understanding of like the needs of military families, the unique challenges and opportunities of military, uh, the military community. And because of that reason, to your point, Julia, I've, I've worked with um, a number of military organizations and veterans organizations, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in fundraising. But it's given me a really kind of unique understanding of the types of donors that are sympathetic to these missions and what really motivates them to give. So oftentimes yeah. it's that feel of patriotism, um, the love for country. And oftentimes it's, you know, that, that these donors recognize the sacrifices that military members and their families are making and, um, and want to provide that support structure as they move across the country every two to three years. Yeah. You know, it's such a uh, unique environment for the nonprofit sector. I mean, you're talking about a clientele group that's not just that service member, but it's their families. I seem to, to see more and more um, veterans oriented organizations that act as communicators to linking those service members and their families two organizations. I mean, are you seeing that as well? Not just like the, we're doing this for this group, but how do we kind of amalgamate all these different organizations? Something you, you know, don't see in other areas. You are so right. And I think that's one of the things that um, makes this particular industry so unique is that I think that they recognize that there's more we can do together. And, and like, listen, there's, you know, any of the organizations I've worked with, they're not wholly unique in what they do. And I think that the strength of it lies in the fact that they recognize that, that they can work together and complement each other with their services and their programs. I mean, there are the, the military community of both service members and their, all of their extended families I mean, there's, um, you know, millions of them, tens of millions. And so this is an opportunity for organizations to kind of work together and say, 
you know, we're doing these things really, really well, and you're doing these things really, really well. And how can we kind of join our forces here to provide these services together more comprehensively? It's such a fascinating thing to witness. And the trajectory is it's so interesting because if you had like an animal welfare organization, you wouldn't necessarily see that collaboration or an arts and culture, you know, structured organization. I mean, it's just so fascinating to me that um, this goes on and there's, um, there's no, I don't want to use the word competition, but there's not this sense, this competitive set, sense that can often arise in other parts of the nonprofit sector. Right? I think you're right. And you know, it's not even to your point that it's not even that word competition. I think I would say there's not that like territorial sort of yes. feeling of dispute. It's and, and maybe this is just a theory. Maybe some of that is because of the transience of the military community. I mean, they're they're not territorial because, you know, by nature, the military is so transient. They move every two to three years, sometimes clear across the country. And so um, one of the things I think that they do very, very well is building communities and kind of picking up right where you left off. And so military families, I think in a nutshell, are very resilient. Yeah, you know, that's a fascinating uh, look into the sector. And I, I, I'm just thrilled. I, like I said, I just always love chatting with you and, and what you do in the sector is just so unique. Um, you know, looking at this this military and veterans and and you know families in service. So I, I'm really really thrilled. But okay, now I got to stop fangirling over Meredith Marion, <laughs> and we got to get to the meat and potatoes. We have this amazing co-host panel, and as Meredith mentioned. You know, she's like a lot of times she's one of our co-hosts, but uh, she is joining us today in the hot seat. And uh, wow, it's really fun whenever Meredith is on. What's also really fun is we have these amazing corporate sponsors and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, your part time controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy, at National University, JMT Consulting and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Okay, Meredith, first one that's come in today, the question. Um, and this is so fascinating because this was what we were just talking about. Um, it's it's a concept, it, the topic is collaboration. And I'm gonna tell you, I took this person's name off uh, because sometimes we do that. I don't want to cause a problem for anyone, to be honest with you. So the question goes like this. I work in programming and have come across a few innovative nonprofits who I think would could we could collaborate with. The issue is that our CEO is resistant to collaboration. He feels that our reputation and mission values could be tarnished. Is this viable or should I try to get him to reconsider collaboration? So this is a really interesting question, and I think it's so timely and fitting because we were just kind of talking about this in our intro. Um, so listen, my opinion on this one is that collaboration is generally always a good thing. So I like to see organizations working together. I think it does a couple of things. One, they are acknowledging that they're probably not the only mission that's addressing that particular area or industry, mm -hmm. right? And oftentimes we see in the nonprofit industry that there are dozens of organizations that are kind of working to address the same problems. So I think first and foremost, it is you kind of recognizing or acknowledging to the world that there you're not wholly unique in what you're doing, that you are um, you're addressing a problem that's really relevant. There are other organizations that are also addressing that problem. And I think that, um, again, to what I said earlier, I think the key here to collaboration is finding ways that you can be complementary to each other's programs or services. So if you come across another organization that's doing something very well that you are not doing, um, that's an opportunity for you to partner together and refer folks to that other organization for the particular service or program that they do very well that you don't do at all. And then they can do the same thing, vice versa. So I think that when, you know, the, the, our, our um, contributor today, when they wrote in on the question said, my CEO is hesitant, 
Yeah. My take on that is probably from a fundraising standpoint. And um, I, I suspect that he or she doesn't want to get in a situation where you are maybe referring or, um, you know, sending your donors to another organization. So again, to the extent that you can work really strategically on the language and the wording of that collaboration, I think that it can actually bring in more donors through the door because you guys are being very complimentary and it gives you a broader platform for the work that you're addressing. You know, I so I love that you mentioned that because I think that's true. I mean, I think that's a uh, you know, operating from a place of fear in terms of your funding is is like what a CEO wakes up with every day, right? Um, but I was challenged by this question because I kept thinking of all the foundations that I work with and that I see that are demanding that their funds are are placed in a collaborative environment. They're saying, look, we'll, you know, we have this money. Usually it's a larger amount, but you got to come to the table with at least one other or two other or people in different regions within your state or different cities within your community. I mean, it's, I don't know about you if you're seeing that, but it's really, really a predominant, I think, trend. So that's an incredible um, point that I don't know that I thought of initially, but you are absolutely right. From a fundraising standpoint, when I kind of put myself back in the seat of a fundraiser, what we often tend to see is large funders and grant makers and foundations that want to know who else are you collaborating with and working with on this problem? And that provides a level of credibility and ethos to your organization when you can say, look at the great work we're doing when we're partnering with, you know, the X, Y, and Z foundation that's, you know, again, has this great name recognition and brand, and it provides a level of credibility to the work you're doing. Right. And I don't think you just like show up and you're like, okay, we're going to work together. You know, you do, Right. MOUs, memos of understanding. You do contracts. You spell out, you know, the 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 um, course with which decisions are made and how things are approved. And it there's a lot of work up front. And um, I don't know about you, Meredith, but before we move on, I know in my community um, there are a couple nonprofit specific attorneys who actually work in the structure, right? Yeah. So, Absolutely. I think it's uh, in a nutshell to answer the question, I would say I would encourage collaboration pretty much all day long and think really strategically to your point, Julia, about how does this look and how do we complement each other and how do we articulate that and communicate that in such a way that it shows that we are very complementary to each other and that we're stronger together. Um, as opposed to a part, because that's probably what's going to motivate more folks to come in and either fund your project or program or to donate to both organizations. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a win-win. Okay, let's go to our next question. It comes to us from Houston, Texas, from William. I've been hearing some rumbling about paying nonprofit board members an annual stipend. Have you heard of this? Frankly, I'm quite surprised and dismayed that this could be a trend to watch your thoughts okay can i be candid here on this yeah. one this yeah. makes me cringe right so i personal opinion from meredith i am fully against paying your board members stipends or um, paying them salaries or anything like that to serve on your board I think that what happens is we see this a lot in the for-profit world. Um, so it's not uncommon at all. In fact, it's a best practice for yes. large for-profit organizations and companies um, to have you know, very prominent boards of advisors that serve as consultants. And so they come in with their you know, very broad expertise and they, um, they, they provide guidance and advisement on how to proceed with business functions, sales functions. They look at things like market trends, and that's all very relevant. I think in the nonprofit industry, we tend to shy away from that for good reason, right? Um, we want to see our board members serving as trusted advisors, but we want to see them donating their time, talent, and treasure. Our board members should be our biggest champions. If our board isn't contributing to our organization, then what compels any other donor to come in and to, to contribute as a donor? 
So, um, and I will tell you from a fundraising standpoint, when I go to apply for, for grants um, or corporate or foundation support, it is not uncommon for these foundations or, or organizations to ask for a list of their board members and say, you know, what percentage of your board is contributing and right. how much. And so I think what's more important actually is to demonstrate that you have policies around board giving, that yeah. there's an expectation that 100% of the board is making a meaningful gift. Some yeah. organizations go so far as to implement give or get policies that stipulate a minimum gift every year. So I'm really curious, all of that said, Julia, what you think here, because like I said, my first reaction is like to cringe at the idea of paying our board members um, to serve in their roles as, as board of directors. Right. Well, I mean, I think what where this is generated from is that, you know, we go in the nonprofit show and the American Nonprofit Academy, we use the number 1.8 million and that 1.8 million registered nonprofits with the U.S. government, that's a lot of competition, right? I mean, in my community alone, there are nearly 30,000 registered nonprofits. And so, and every, think about it, every organization needs generally at minimum, you know, five to eight, and that's a pretty skinny board you know, five yeah. to eight members. And so multiply that out. That's a heck of a lot of people working for free. And so I think you're right. We're, we're borrowing from, from the for-profit sector thinking, oh, well, we just need to pay people. Um, I maintain, and I just published a new book called Building Board Champions. I maintain that when you are a board member, you get a lot, you get paid a lot. You get paid a lot in terms of leadership, in terms of training, in terms of connectivity, building a stronger community. I could go on and on and on about why and how it works, right? So um, I do think it's somewhat problematic. Um, I can tell you that in some sectors like the um, credit union space, which they are nonprofits, um, they, I'm seeing more of these organizations start to pay their board members. But to your point, they're coming on almost like employees, right? They have very specific duties. They're not just showing up for the monthly meeting or monthly committee meeting, right? So it changes, you know, the, the tenor. I don't believe we should be paying our board members. I think we should be, you know, paying them with opportunity, if you will, and and the joy of being a philanthropist and and being benevolent in your community um but i just think it's a slippery slope and i think it would be really really um a problem with funders william to to meredith's point man i think if you reported that out it'd be like next <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And, you know, Julia, you said something that's really insightful, which is, you know, the organizations where, you know, and I do think it's absolutely the minority right now. But in the in the instances where we do see nonprofits compensating their board members, mm -hmm. I think it's more of a, um, a relationship in which they are um, fulfilling a, a very specific role or duty almost to an employee kind of standpoint. And I'll give you an example. I actually worked with an organization as a consultant that did this very thing. And it was a, a medically affiliated organization. So their whole mission was to work with and educate medical professionals on the dangers of certain drugs. And because of that, they did a lot of things where they would publish medical journals and they sure. like very highly technical um, sure. publications on, on things like medication and pharmacy. And so they had a a seat on their board, which was a medical director. And this particular person was compensated, but they brought to the organization such a very, very specific and unique skill set um, and area of expertise. And, you know, again, there it's a, it was a physician and a scientist. And so for that reason, they were compensated for their contributions to the board. So, yeah, so I think you're right. There are instances in which it may be appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's a, as you, you mentioned, that's a task oriented thing. Well, you know what? I think we're going to be hearing more about this, Meredith. I really do. I think it's going to start to, you know, bubble up to the surface and it'll be interesting to see. Okay. Judy writes from Reno, Nevada and asks, while I realize that we are just starting out summer vacations, our nonprofit 
is already thinking about closing the week between Christmas and New Year's. We would do this to reward our team for achieving goals and get everyone refreshed to start 2025. Do you have any opinion on this? Now, I don't think we've ever been asked this question. We have not, but I will tell you, um, I've been I've worked with several organizations that do this very thing. And I think that um, on one hand, it's really good for team morale. Um, I think it's a really nice way to, you know, listen, it's no secret in the nonprofit industry that oftentimes we can't compete in salaries and benefits with our for profit counterparts. So I think that this is a really creative way to provide something unique to your employees that is a, well, you know, a perk or benefit of employment. Um, and, and I think it also encourages a really healthy work-life balance and allows folks to take time, you know, meaningful time with their families and their children when they're out of school. Um, now, here's what I'll say from a professional standpoint and a fundraising standpoint. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, what, about, what about money? <laughs> right. So year-end giving is what we tend to see in the nonprofit industry is like the biggest push for for. Um, annual giving, right? Uh, most of it statistically comes in the last quarter of the year and even more so in the last month of the year. Mm -hmm. So we tend to see as a trend in philanthropy that donors tend to give in the last month of the year. It's the holidays. Um, they're coming up on the end of that calendar year, and that makes a difference for them financially with taxes. And so there's a lot of activity taking place at the end of the year. Uh, with year end giving. So when you're working in a nonprofit, particularly in a fundraising role, that's something to be really conscious of. It's very, very important that there is somebody there who is able to answer questions, facilitate gifts and acknowledge gifts as they come in. So if you can work out a way or a, a procedure or a policy in which maybe I've worked with an organization before who took kind of a unique take on this and they had a bit of a rotating schedule so there was always one person who was available to monitor emails, to answer requests and, you know, to kind of handle any, any fires as they popped up in that last week of the year. Mm -hmm. I like that Meredith. And even if you did like a truncated schedule where you're like, okay, we're going to have coverage between, you know, eight and one or eight and two or yeah, I, I agree with you on that because it is a frightening thing to, to turn away from some potential gifts. And so, yeah. Okay, good. Well, Judy, I hope this helps um, because I think you can do a little bit of both if that makes sense. Okay, let's go to another name with Hal. This comes to us from New York. Do you think a conflict of interest policy is the same as a non-disclosure agreement when it comes to board members? We are wondering if we should add an NDA policy that protects our donor and fundraising info. We are a cultural institution with some very high net worth patrons. I bet being in the city, I bet that's true. Okay, so this is a really interesting question. Um, so here's what I think I have to say about this one. A conflict of interest policy and a non-disclosure agreement serve very different purposes and are not the same thing, especially in the context of board members. So the, conflict, the conflict of interest policy generally outlines kind of guidelines to identify or disclose or manage situations where like board members um, are disclosing personal interests that could potentially conflict with their duties as the as a, you know, a fiduciary oversight of the organization. So in other words, it helps to maintain transparency among your donors and among the public. Um, to ensure that like the best best um, decisions are being made in the best interest of the organization. Mm -hmm. I think a non-disclosure agreement, on the other hand, is a legal contract that requires board members to keep confidential certain information. Um, mm -hmm. And it protects the information or sensitive information about your donors from being disclosed to um, to unauthorized parties or people that maybe shouldn't have access to your donor database. So while they're both, I think, equally important, I think they serve very different um, purposes and they, they uh, regulate different board activities and different responsibilities of your board. So I would suggest in this case that you probably have both and that they are separate and distinct. 
Right. I agree. I, I, 100 percent. That's exactly what I would have said. You know, the COI policy, conflict of interest policy is generally managed by your accounting department, um, oftentimes through, through the CPA, because it's part of the 990 filing. Right. And so those folks take that on because they want to be able to check that box that you have organizationally a COI policy. Um, I think the NDA thing is very smart. And I also think if you are, I mean, this this right, this person wrote in that they're a cultural organization, but let's say you do medical, you're you're bound to HIPAA laws. And so that would be like another part of that, depending on what it is you're doing. If you're working with children or minors, um, yeah. you know, minors being under the age of 21, children being under the age of 18, you have other things to think about as well. So Again, this is, I think, a piece where you need to bring in an attorney, somebody that works in the nonprofit sector, not just a general attorney, but hopefully you can find, you know, nonprofit uh, specific and then get them to help, as Meredith says, getting these two very distinct um, tools. And then Meredith, I don't know about you, but I'm like all like waving the banner of getting all these policies executed every year by your yeah. board. And in, in the case of some organizations, your C-suite, depending on how you're structured. And that should be done by December, the year prior. So that as you start January, everybody's up to speed. Everybody has the, um, you know, all those compliance issues are done. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's incredibly important. I think that speaks to you know good board governance policy so you know you there it's it's a good opportunity for you to get really organized and to get from your board things that you need um, before you start your new fiscal year or your new calendar year so you know have a policy in place where you reach out to your board and you thank them for their annual donations you tell them well you know maybe it's a, a nice you know um, note in which you tell them everything that you were able to accomplish in the year and then you have a section in that newsletter that has something to do with you know board business we need updated conflict of interest policies and updated non-disclosures and some organizations go so far as to ask their boards um, to to communicate how they'd like to make their giving for the following year so this is a good way to to bring in some you know best practices in board governance and how you manage your board yeah i love it i think that's really great well hopefully um this helps that organization because this is a big topic and now is the time to be thinking about this before we move into that busy as you mentioned q4 where so much money is is being you know moved throughout our country um, the Giving USA report just has been launched. Um, so there's a lot of talk about what's going on uh, across the sector. And so these are these are the right questions to be discussing, I think, Meredith, right now. Meredith, as always, Meredith Terrian, trainer at Fundraising Academy, founder of the Allied Group. Fundraising-academy.org is where you can meet, uh, learn more about Meredith and meet some of the other trainers who do amazing work with Fundraising Academy at National University. Meredith, I always love what you have to say. You always like spark some new ideas. You teach me a lot. Thank you, my friend. Well, thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure to be in the hot seat this time, kind of answering the questions instead of asking them. So as always, it was a pleasure and looking forward to doing it again. Absolutely. Well, we are just delighted that we have you on our team as well with the nonprofit show is one of our valuable co-hosts. It's really a cool thing to get to work with you and learn about, you know, your work. It's so different. And I hope, um, you know, we Meredith and I are going to collaborate. I use that word from our first question. We are going to collaborate on more um, uh, veterans oriented, you know, uh, episodes and guests. So you'll be hearing more about that because I think it's just such a great thing to have this um, brain trust that you bring, Meredith. And um, it's something I don't know anything about. And so to bring you in and get you know more clarification is really powerful. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody, as we end another episode of The Nonprofit Show, we want to make sure that we thank all of our amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 
180 Management Group Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that make it so wonderful to be a part of these discussions. Hey, Meredith, you know, as we end every episode, we also like to end with this mantra, and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. <laughs>